Hello buddy, Sanyer, engineer, MBA, and investor. In today's video, I wanted to play this interview that happened just under a week ago between NASDAQ, yes, you heard right, NASDAQ, and ARK Invest plus CRISPR Therapeutic CEO, Dr. Sam. And that's really an interesting interview because it's really rare that you see NASDAQ giving interviews. Um, this may be the first time I've ever listened to an interview between NASDAQ and one of the companies listed on their platform, right? I understand the concept of NASDAQ and so on. It's just, I didn't think they would be giving interviews to the companies on their platform, which is actually a really smart thing to do, you know, instead of relying on legacy media to do, you know, to publish your companies uh, on your platform, you might as well do it yourself and see, you know, how much attraction you can get. So I love that idea. But what's really interesting on top of all of this is ARK Invest also joined to this conversation. So this is about 12 minutes. I sort of gave it like a 25% speed up there. Uh, you guys can watch this interview on your own. I mean, I'll link it in the bottom, but let's play it. Let's see what uh, we can uh, garner from this and learn from this. So let's go ahead and play it. Cholesterol. Thank you for having me. Um, we're in a very exciting period in the advancement of science and technology for biomedical innovation. Uh, it's only been 10 years since the advent of CRISPR, uh, the technology. And here we are on the cusp of a BLA filing, which means that we're going to bring it to patients commercially for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Uh, at CRISPR Therapeutics recently announced data that showed that 31 of 31 sickle cell patients treated with the CRISPR-based cell therapy had a functional cure. Uh, and that's just astounding and remarkable and shows the power of the next generation cell therapies. But we're just scratching the surface at this point. I think that as we go forward, the engineering is advancing, the science is advancing, and we're gonna see next generation cell therapies go from rare diseases all the way to common diseases. And actually cholesterol is not that far fetched. You know, we have a program where we're uh, editing certain genes in the liver that will lower your LDL cholesterol for life from a one-time intervention. Uh, we're actually making cell therapies that produce insulin that would take away the needs for need for every uh, week or every day insulin injections. Uh, so the future is bright, uh, and there are a lot of possibilities for patients suffering from these diseases. Um, Ali, just to bring you in here, I mean, you focus on gene editing, stem cell, and novel immunotherapy technologies at ARC. And when you listen to Sam talk about all the potential here, do you think investors have a good grasp of the opportunities and advancements? I mean, where do you, where do you see the biggest opportunities that uh, we might be missing right now? You know, Sam mentioned some great ones, and I think investors are certainly watching this space carefully. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting about ARC and differentiates us is that all of our backgrounds are from non-traditional finance backgrounds. So, for example, I was doing cancer research at Sloan Kettering. My partner, Simon Barnett, was more of an engineering background. And I think this makes us poised to find these opportunities. I think Sam gave some really interesting uh, examples of some of the opportunities that we see as important, going from these rare diseases like sickle and beta thal to some of the more common diseases, like Sam mentioned, and cardiovascular diseases, um, which obviously CRISPR therapeutics and also VERB therapeutics, another portfolio company in ARK are working on are, are really going to be quite transformative and also are going to take our healthcare system more from, you know, a downstream approach. So treating someone once they already have a cancer, for example, to a more upstream approach, like can we get to someone before they have a heart attack just because they're at risk for having a heart attack? Um, I also think next gen CRISPR approaches are very interesting, like base editing. So, you know, not doing the double stranded DNA break. We're watching the space carefully and I think investors are as well. Uh, Sam, let's drill down on some of the successes with cellular immunotherapies and talk about what's next in store for the immuno-oncology cell therapy. And we heard Ali talking a little bit about base editing and this idea also of off-the-shelf technology versus the personalized, which can take a lot longer. Uh, what, what's in store for us in the immuno-oncology space? If we're going to look at cancer care very differently in the coming years. Um, you know, if you look at the last 60 years of the modern war against cancer, we've tried everything in our, in our hands from toxic chemicals, all the way to antibodies, and small molecules to try and cure cancer. Uh, and oftentimes, as we think about cancer care, you know, you see images of patients with hair loss, with pain, uh, nephropathy, and neuropathies, and all that. And, you know, what we have now is a very different way of treating cancers. We're retraining our immune cells to go attack the cancers. And in the first instance of it, we took the patient's own immune cells, retrained it to go recognize the cancer and kill it. And that showed remarkable success. But that doesn't reach all the patients that deserve and need this care. What we're doing is using CRISPR to create an off-the-shelf immunotherapy. So we take a young, healthy person's immune system, retrain it, engineer those cells so that they're smart cells that can go recognize and kill the cancers, not just in heme malignancies or blood cancers, but also in solid tumors. Um, that can be revolutionary because one, it's a one-time treatment. 
Two, it's much safer. You don't have all the toxicities associated with cancer care. And here we have a one-time treatment that could be in the future curative and cancer won't be the same as we know it today. Ali, do you think it can scale and that the cost can come down to make this practical uh, across the board? We highlighted three different avenues. So the first was we looked at autologous to allogeneic, so just what Sam mentioned, more of kind of using your own cells versus using an off-the-shelf approach. We also highlighted shifts from going from liquid tumor to solid tumor, because liquid tumor, we have a gold standard, and we also know that solid tumors are 88% of all diagnosed tumors. Um, so very important unmet need, but also huge market opportunity. Um, and we looked at how long that could actually take. Um, and we hypothesized using Gleevec as an example, which is an oral chemotherapy. Um, that took about 10 years of clinical trials, seven of which were for solid tumor. So we hypothesized using Gleevec as an example that the first CAR-T for solid tumors um, could be approved in 2025. Um, so that would be great. But from a cost perspective, we actually did some work on this as well. And we found that per life year, um, actually having some of these therapies, which maybe are more expensive, but potentially could be one-time doses um, or just maybe less chronic and fewer doses could actually be cheaper on a cost per life year basis. So Sam, in addition to all the excitement and advances that we're seeing in the cancer space, there's also the potential application for autoimmune disorders, uh, infectious diseases, which uh, we've all become uh, very familiar with. What are some of the specific ways that this is being applied right now? Yeah, and don't forget neurodegenerative diseases. You know, one of the big things we're going to face in society over the next 20 years are diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's that uh, that are going to be, you know, debilitating as people live longer. And I think these cell therapies are now being advanced in autoimmune diseases, as you said, where you can actually engineer cells again to prevent uh, autoimmune diseases. Um, and this can also be curative. Uh, you can do transplant procedures uh, with modified cells for autoimmune diseases. Uh, in infectious diseases, you can use CRISPR gene editing potentially to cure hepatitis B. Um, these are diseases that have been very hard to address with small molecules or antibodies. Um, so you're looking at uh, a number of disease areas where people are going to advance these, these therapies, whether in the form of cell therapies or gene therapies. Um, and you're going to see more and more data come out. And by the way, to the cost equation that you just alluded to previously, um, you know, we're very passionate about bringing these therapies to patients around the world. Um, I grew up in India personally, and I'm, I'm very interested in saying, how can we create medicines that not only can address the patient population in the U.S. and Western Europe, but all, all around the world? And in the, in the case of cancers, you know, because you're using a healthy donor, a young healthy donor as a source for these cell therapies, you can create thousands of doses. And the patient's body then becomes the biofactory where you expand the cells and make more of it. Um, and eventually, I think these can be uh, pretty important in, in India, China, and other countries because you're kind of leapfrogging from the, small, the antibody world, from small molecules all the way to cell therapies. Um, and I think all of these, whether it's cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, autoimmune, infectious diseases, they're all going to be available globally. Ali, when you look at this space um, and for investors, is this a place where there's going to be multiple winners for a disease or a category, or is it a winner-take-all situation? Yeah, we actually believe there could be multiple winners. Um, you know, how we think about evaluating stocks and, and maybe looking at some of these companies is we do a very top down and bottoms up research process. Um, so one of the things we do is we size the opportunity and then we also do very detailed company models. And we highlighted that gene editing and gene therapy companies could scale about 54%. That's at a compound annual growth rate. Um, and it could be at about 130 billion to 1.1 trillion by 2026. And then we also show that by 2026, the share of R&D spending devoted to gene editing and gene therapy companies could grow from 3% to 17%. So, you know, we don't believe that this is a, a winner takes all. We believe that this is going to create a new vertical in which it's going to go cross pipeline, right? So we've talked about oncology, we've talked about infectious diseases, we've talked about autoimmune diseases, Sam brought up, you know, neuro. So it, it's not just going to be for one indication or one specific, um, you know, pipeline asset. It's going to go so much deeper and broader than that. But Sam, I mean, you live and breathe this every day, so it's no surprise to you. But when you listen to Ali speaking about sizing of the opportunity, I mean, do you sometimes feel like there's a mismatch between the actual innovation, what's going on, and the, the valuations in a way, or the attention? Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, if you think about the overall pharma market, there's about, you know, $2.5 trillion ascribed to all the pharma companies that are still somewhat living in a, in a world where they focus on small molecules or antibodies. And what we have here is cell and gene therapies that are going to form a whole new category of medicines that could be a third or more of the, the entire uh, pharma market in the next five to 10 years. And, and I think it takes time for some of the bigger companies to switch and shift to where the innovation is happening, but it also takes time for investors to switch that mindset. And, and you've seen that with the antibody space in the 80s, it took a while for people to recognize the potential of it, but today, half the pharma market is antibodies, but it took 20 years in some cases. Um, but, but you know, what's amazing, and I, I'm here in Boston 
which has become the epicenter of uh, some of the biomedical uh, revolution or all the research, you know, what we're learning about human genomics, about what are genes and code, what we're learning about all the delivery technologies so we can get these medicines to different organs, what we're learning about the different modalities like gene editing and mRNA, and mRNA just was so important in this whole COVID crisis. This is all coming together and the confluence of this innovation is gonna get recognized pretty quickly. And we're gonna see more recognition, but more importantly, we're gonna see more meaningful drugs that impact patients. And that's what this is all about. Sam and Ali, thank you both so much for joining us. It's been fascinating to get to talk with you. Okay, so, uh, so this was basically uh, a high level interview. I think uh, they went over high level topics, which is fine. I mean, I didn't expect more than that, especially in an interview given by a you know platform like NASDAQ. Uh, it's not really the, the type of interview you're going to get very granular. And uh, I definitely wouldn't want it to get granular, especially, like I said, the type of interview this was being hosted on. Um, so a great interview. I mean, Ali from ARK invested very well. I think she answered many of the questions about economy and the opportunity uh, very well. But then again, you know, most of those answers were basically straight out from the big ideas 2022 slides from ARK Invest earlier this year. So not that, like I said, no re relevation there, uh, but very well uh, articulated there. As far as Dr. Sam, I think those answers he gave were really good, especially towards the end where he talks about how, you know, genome editing companies are unfairly valued compared to, um, quote unquote, and this is me, uh, saying this, but legacy pharma companies, you know, he's saying how legacy pharma companies are worth like 2.5 trillion uh, and that genome editing should be worth at least a third in the upcoming few years. So that's interesting, but I wouldn't say anything new here in this interview. I just found it interesting that at the beginning of this interview, Ali actually, you know, pointed out cardiovascular diseases, uh, which makes sense. It is the leading, leading cause of that in America, in Canada, and in, and, and in basically a lot of nations in the world. Uh, so the TAM is huge, but it's it's interesting that they brought up Verve Therapeutics. You know, she brought up Verve Therapeutics, which is fine. I mean, they're on Nasdaq as well, so it's not like you're it's not like you're 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 going. You know, you're leaving. It's not like you're talking about a company that has absolutely nothing to do with NASDAQ, plus it's a genome editing company, which is fine, but I just found it interesting that they brought up Verf Therapeutics. You know, they didn't bring up, you know, the other CRISPR companies for other type of diseases like NTLA, Caribou's working on cancer. Uh, they didn't bring this, this company up. Um, I mean, that's interesting. Uh, but anyways, uh, it was a good interview. I think Dr. Sam did very well, especially with the uh, cancer uh, side of things. I think it's ridiculous that we, it's like the perfect analogy is like, you know, instead of fixing a specific part of a, you know, a car, uh, you're just basically beating down the car with a hammer. That's basically what chemotherapy is on the human body. So uh, hoping that it's going to fix it, which is obviously, you know, it may or may not fix it. I mean, but is it the most efficient way? Absolutely not. So uh, like I said, great interview here. Well, let me know in the comments below what you guys think. Uh, about this interview, I think it's it's it may be the first time, it may actually be the only time we're gonna, ever going to see like Arc Invest, CRISPR Therapeutics, and a Nasdaq interview. That's a really interesting. I, I've never seen this. I maybe I'm, I'm, I'm uh, maybe I haven't been exposed to Nasdaq uh, website or whatever they do besides just hosting companies on their platform to trade and sell, but. Um, it's really interesting. So let me know in the comments below what you guys think. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, like I said, daily videos are back. No coughing to, in today's video. That's uh, that's an improvement, right? Shout out to one of the users there. Made a joke. Uh, they made it because uh, yesterday's video I was talking about Teladoc, and which is obviously the telemedicine company where you connect with doctors. And uh, one of the users said, a commenter said, I said, maybe you should be going on Teladoc and booking yourself a doctor for your cough. So that I found that really funny. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.